Today, press freedom under attack around the world. Authoritarian regimes crack down on reporters, where they can go, who they can speak to, and what issues they can report. A new press index says a cycle of fear is eroding press freedom around the world and in America. We will discuss what is fueling the rising hate and distrust of journalists and how it impacts what you read, see, and you hear. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren. May 3rd is World Press Freedom Day, but based on the trends that we are seeing around the world, it does not look good for reporters. The latest World Press Freedom Index shows a steady decline of what we call a free press, including right here in the United States where reporting critical to some in high office is sometimes called fake news. Plugged In's Elizabeth Chernoff reports the deaths and dangers journalists endured in 2018. In April, an Islamic State suicide bomber in Afghanistan, posing as a member of the media, killed 26 people, including nine journalists who were rushing to the scene following the initial explosion. In June, a gunman walked into a Maryland newsroom and opened fire, killing five local newspaper staffers. And in October, Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi was murdered inside a Saudi consulate in Turkey. From kidnappings and murders to imprisonment, the threat to journalists is on the rise in what experts say is an increasingly alarming trend. Journalists in democracies are increasingly at threat, and journalists in countries not in conflict are still paying the ultimate price for their reporting. According to Reporters Without Borders, at least 63 professional journalists were killed in 2018. The top three deadliest countries for journalists are Afghanistan, Syria, and Mexico, according to the report. But the attacks aren't limited to killings. The jailing of journalists is also on the rise. The Committee to Protect Journalists says China, Turkey, and Egypt are responsible for more than half of the total number of imprisonments. Officials cited cases like the one in Myanmar, which sentenced two Reuters journalists to seven years in prison this year. They uh, uncovered a, a war crime, an atrocity. And for that, they were set up by the police, uh, accused of having uh, stolen documents, which they did not. And now, now in a mockery of uh, judicial process, they have been thrown in jail. Those are exactly the kinds of journalists in their own country reporting on their governments that are, that are running into trouble. You're creating violence by your questions. You know, you are creating you. And also, a lot of the reporters are creating violence by not writing the truth. The fake news is creating violence. In the U.S., the president's heated anti-media rhetoric is setting an example for other leaders who want to attack the press, experts say. By calling them fake news, uh, he's saying they're illegitimate. By saying that they're failing, he's saying they're on the wrong side of history. Uh, uh, and by saying that they're the enemy of the people, he is saying that uh, I am the people, if they're my enemy, if they criticize me, they're really criticizing you. Public trust in the American press is at an all-time low in what some say is a broader illustration of an overall global decline of press freedom. But there are some positive signs of change, too. In Ethiopia, which is undergoing democratic reforms implemented by the new prime minister, Abiy Ahmed, no journalists are reported jailed for the first time in 14 years. And that's not all. Well, we have seen some changes in the regimes in certain countries like Ecuador, South Korea, the Gambia, which have accounted for some of the uh, improvements in our World Press Freedom Index. Yet, as journalists continue their work around the world, the latest reports signal they will be doing so in an increasingly difficult and risky environment. Elizabeth Cherneff, VOA News, Washington. And the ability of reporters to question those in power is not getting better. With more on the best and worst countries for journalists, here is Plugged In's Mil Sega. Of the 180 countries in the list, the worst offenders remain unchanged. Turkmenistan still occupies the bottom slot, followed by North Korea, Eritrea, China, and Vietnam. The highest ranked countries for press freedoms are at number one, Norway, followed by Finland, Sweden, the Netherlands, and Denmark. Some of the notable declines, though, include the United States and the Americas. The U.S. fell three slots and now ranks 48th in the world. 
In comparison, Canada was unchanged at 18th place. Mexico improved slightly, up three slots at 144. Venezuela and Argentina declined by five, putting Venezuela in 148th place, and Argentina fell to 57. Joining us to explain why press freedom is important is a frequent contributor to our show, Robert Mahoney. He is direct, Deputy Executive Director at the Committee to Protect Journalists. He has worked as a reporter and was once bureau chief and editor at Reuters International. He has written extensively on press freedom and has led CPJ missions to global hotspots from Iraq to Sri Lanka. Thank you for joining us, sir. Good morning. Just as an overview for people who are watching, because we have an audience around the world, we have a, a constitution of free press here in the United States. But in general, how important is free press to the world? It's the underpinning of democracy and it's the uh, journalists are really on the front lines of holding governments accountable and uh, providing transparency. What is happening to people's rights, how their tax uh, money is spent. And without journalists, governments can uh, Im implement uh, policies which restrict those rights and corruption thrives. Is there any way to reconcile in our first two reports it said that the three most dangerous places for reports were uh, for reporters is Iraq, Syria, and Mexico, yet on the index of, of press freedom, Mexico has now risen to a better position. It is improving, yet it's so profoundly dangerous for journalists. Can you reconcile that? Well, I think uh, we at the Committee to Protect Journalists, we don't publish that index. I think the, 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 the uh, thing for me is that in Mexico, you have the deliberate murder by criminal gangs uh, and narco traffickers of journalists who are trying to report on corruption and how the cartels have infiltrated uh, particularly state government and undermined the, uh, the rule of law outside of Mexico City in a way that makes it extremely difficult to be an investigative journalist there. You contrast that against what's happening in war zones or conflict zones such as Iraq or Syria where a lot of journalists are on the front lines are caught in bombings and the rest of it. So you have a difference between targeted murder in a country like Mexico and conflict reporting in many of the Middle East countries. Is there some correlation for the increased danger or the decline in, in safety or protection or press freedoms uh, around the world? Is there some correlation to social media or not? Is it helping or hurting? Social media is one of those uh, things that I suppose we could call it a dual use technology. When it first came out, it enabled a lot of uh, journalists and bloggers, particularly those in restricted countries, to be able to publish. They could bypass the normal channels that were controlled by the government. But governments are now using social media against journalists to control speech and to control information. And there's a lot of pollution of the information pool. Uh, on social media. This is something that we as uh, journalists are grappling with. It's something that the, the companies that provide these platforms are also looking at. And I think what happens is that rumors rather than news can spread incredibly quickly on social media. And we have seen the physical consequences of that, particularly in the subcontinent where there have been uh, uh, people killed in India and Sri Lanka because of rumors that are spread, which actually underlines the need for journalists because journalists check out rumors and try to put out facts on social media. But at the moment, we have, uh, a, a, as I said, a, a kind of a pollution of the information system on social media, which we all need to grapple with. How does, how does sort of the expanding definition of journalists impact this? I mean, you have the journalists or the conventional, traditional journalists, but then on the other end of the spectrum, you might have a blogger, and even beyond that, you might have an activist blogger with, a, with an axe to grind, for instance, which may be confused with, with, the, with the conventional journalist. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a big problem. And, and uh, we at the Committee to Protect Journalists take a very uh, common sense approach to this and look at people who are what I would say performing acts of journalism. So we're looking at what people do and not as how they self-identify. Uh, a few years ago, it was easy uh, to, uh, to be a journalist. You worked for a, a recognized news outlet. You had a press card. Those days are gone. So we're looking at who is doing reporting, who is consistently gathering news and publishing it, and doing acts of journalism, and we would regard those people as journalists, as opposed to people who are taking part in demonstrations and photographing it. Those are more activists or protesters. So even someone like in the, in the Sudanese uh, demonstration protests in Khartoum recently, if they were every day blogging and taking pictures and putting them up on the, on the internet, for instance, because of the media being shut down there, would they, they would not be considered considered journalists or, or they are? 
I think that what they're doing is journalism. The big difference is in the action rather than the label, because governments make no distinction. We saw this uh, with the uprisings in the, in the Arab world uh, in, in 2011 onwards, where people who had never been journalists, suddenly they were the only ones who could document what was going on. They were so appalled by the violence against the protests that they saw that every day they went out, they started to film or they started to write about what they saw. And governments went after them. Governments uh, tried to control them and actually jailed and killed many of them. So I would regard what they were doing as journalism, even though it wouldn't fit in with the traditional, particularly uh, you know, professional definitions that we have been used to. In the 30 seconds we have left, uh, any tip for news organizations how to protect their journalists, especially when they're in very dangerous places? Yeah, absolutely. They need to. Uh, those that don't already do it need to need to provide the the people working for them with uh, information about how to plan for a dangerous assignment. They need to be given their, their protective equipment, you know, uh, flak jackets, helmets, etc. If they're going to a place where they need that, and they need to be able to have insurance and uh, medical care if they, are, if they are injured. Because a lot of the people that we rely on now for our news are freelancers, people without much money who don't work for big news organizations. And they often don't have the, the uh, monetary resources to be able to protect themselves like those who work for big news organizations do. Robert Mahoney, CPJ Deputy Executive Director, thank you for joining us. Thank you. A stark example of the declining state of press freedom around the world is in the Philippines. And once again, here's Plugged In's Mil Arcega. Once regarded as a country with one of the greatest press freedoms in Asia, the Philippines under President Rodrigo Duterte currently ranks 134 on the press freedom list. Rappler.com, one of the most popular news websites in the country, has become the target of an online harassment campaign for its critical reporting of the president's you know the policies, plot, right? including his use of extrajudicial killings, giving local police the authority to kill thousands of drug dealers without the benefit of a trial. Duterte has labeled Rappler fake news and has filed numerous lawsuits against the publication, accusing its reporters of libel and claiming the company violated a constitutional ban on foreign ownership. The government has arrested Rappler's co-founder and executive editor, Maria Ressa, at least twice in the last two months, a tactic media watchdogs say is meant to intimidate the president's critics. Besides her 30 years of reporting, Maria Ressa is also CEO and executive editor of Rappler.com. She's won numerous awards for her reports and was recently named Time Magazine's Person of the Year. She was formerly CNN's bureau chief in Manila and Jakarta. She joins us live via Skype from Manila, Philippines. Nice to talk to you. Good to speak with you, Greta. Uh, we, the world's been pretty much following what's going on with Rap, Rappler, or at least the journalism world, Rappler and the Philippines. But let me start with the Philippines. Does the Philippines, does it have in its constitution free press? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Constitution in the Philippines, 1987 Constitution, is fashioned after the United States. So not only do we have similar provisions, we have a Bill of Rights, um, freedom of speech, freedom of the um, press are enshrined in it. So why are you banned? Why is Rappler banned from covering the president of the Philippines? Uh, it's been 14 months that Rappler has been banned, um, not just in the palace, but across the country in any private event, uh, with the whim of the president. And that's part of the reason that we've actually filed a case at the Supreme Court. It's, it's a test case, a uh, press, uh, press freedom case. And uh, just yesterday, uh, there was an intervention by 41 other journalists from New, other news groups that normally compete with each other. This is the first time that uh, journalists are coming together to make sure that these kinds of creeping bans are stopped and uh, that the executive is held accountable. Is there any doubt that Rappler is a news organization? Give us a little history. How long has it been around? What does Rappler do? Um, Rappler, there is no doubt that Rappler is a news or organization. Um, the government has accredited us. We are accredited at the palace until the president whimsically decided uh, to ban our reporter. Um, we do investigative stories. Uh, we started a startup seven years ago in 2012, and uh, we Oh my gosh, uh, if you ask me for the elevator pitch for Rappler, we build communities of action. We fuse technology 
and journalism together to build communities. I think where we differ from traditional news groups is that we use technology to build communities. So, for example, in the question you had earlier, um, in, in our experience, social media, technology, social media platforms play a key role in the rollback of democracy in many countries around the world, and the Philippines is a great case study of that. The kind of exponential attacks against me, against Rappler, you're talking about as much as 90 hate messages per hour. These are coordinated, and we've shown how they are directly related to the palace, to the government, pro-government supporters, proxies, and the government itself. It I, I suppose I was trying to figure out what Pre President Duterte was doing, how he was getting around it. And in reading the Constitution, it says no law shall be enacted to, you know, to step on basically uh, press freedom. I suspect that what he is saying is that no law has been enacted or is. He's just on his personal whim or whatever. He's just banning you. And is that how he's getting around that constitutional provision? That's exactly how nothing is written. And, you know, there are many things that have happened that way. For example, the burial of Ferdinand Marcos uh, that happened without anything written. Um, it's the way our president today, President Duterte, gets around very tricky issues of the Constitution. Now, so he's banned, he's banned Rappler, banned you. Is there physical danger also involved? And I'm not, and that's, I'm not asking that to take away from ob the obvious you know, issue about uh, stepping on free press, but is there a physical danger for any of you? You never know. You know, we know around the world that online violence leads to real world violence. And so we've increased security in Rappler. But I think, you know, I want to bring up that this kind of weaponization of social media going bottom up with exponential attacks is coupled with the government also coming top down. In July 2017, in his State of the Nation address, President Duterte charged Rappler. Within a week, we had our first investigation in cases. Uh, if you look in the last 14 months, uh, the Philippine government has filed 11 cases against us. In two months, I've had to post bail eight times. And in just five weeks, I was arrested twice and detained once. That is uh, a, an extreme erosion of, of our freedoms. Given the history of President Duterte, and uh, we know a little bit about him, I follow a little bit about him. If the Supreme Court should rule in your favor, with Rappler uh, in your favor, is President Duterte likely to take the cue from the Supreme Court and follow them, or is he going to be dismissive and not follow? What's your prediction? We have a veneer of rule of law, and if the Supreme Court were to first take up the case and then rule against it, there would, there would be a veneer of following it, you know, in the same way that there's a veneer of due process in these numerous cases that have been filed against us. But the reality is that we almost have a captured system, right? So um, it's up to the Philippine judiciary to prove its independence, and that's part of what we're asking for in going through this process. Are the other news organizations, I realize there are 41 that have come out in favor you for the Supreme Court thing, but are other news organizations in the Philippines putting this on their front page and constantly standing, uh, you know, in solidarity with Rappler every single day so the pressure's on? Not always, but increasingly so. Uh, just last week, uh, the presidential palace, the spokesman, actually released what they call a matrix of, and the matrix are, are supposed coup plotters, and these are news organizations, independent news organizations. Um, just today, uh, the Secretary Panello, our presidential spokesman, said that the president doesn't need evidence to actually release this, these coup plotters, right, which is false. This is laying the ground for more attacks against the media. And what we're asking for is, you know, that this kind of death by a thousand cuts, that there be some accountability. Um, I think what you're seeing is really this kind of slow erosion. Uh, and because it's slow, coupled with the violence that comes from the drug war, you're talking about the UN estimates a, a death toll from July 2016 of 27,000 people. That's a lot. So it creates this climate of fear that makes it difficult to actually speak out. There are risks to speaking out. Well, we're going to be following this, uh, Maria. We have been following it. Uh, and good luck. Maria Ressa, Rappler's CEO. Nice to see you. Ms. Ress's battles with authorities is just one of many around the world. Plugged in has also been following the case of two Reuters reporters who were jailed in Myanmar in 2017. 
Wallon and Jaso U were arrested while investigating mass graves of Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. The journalists have unsuccessfully appealed their case several times through Myanmar's courts. And in April, Myanmar's highest court, their Supreme Court, rejected their final appeal and upheld their seven-year sentence. Reuters and human rights groups worldwide have expressed extreme disappointment in the high court's decision. But the efforts of these two Reuters reporters to uncover the truth has not gone unnoticed. The two reporters were recently awarded the Pulitzer Prize for their reporting. Reuters has vowed to continue the fight to free Wallone and Jaso U. For more on that effort, I'm joined via Skype by Reuters Editor-in-Chief Stephen J. Adler, who is in New York. He's Vice Chairman of the Board of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. He's a member of the Board of the Committee to Protect Journalists. Good, evening, good afternoon, sir. And tell me, um, what is the next step? If the High Court has ruled against those two Reuters reporters, what possibly can be ne next? Would that be to appeal to Aung San Suu Kyi? Um, th thanks, Greta, for uh, continuing to be concerned about this issue. It, it, uh, they've been in prison for 506 days now for just reporting the truth. Um, you may have seen that over the past few weeks, um, Myanmar has freed actually thousands of prisoners through pardons. And the most obvious and likely next step would be a pardon for Wallon and Jaso U. So we're certainly very much hoping that ha that happens. Uh, it's, it's time for them to be free. Uh, this isn't good for Myanmar. It isn't good for free press. Um, Aung San Suu Kyi has expressed support in the past for human rights and for free press. And pardoning them would be the, the best way to show that uh, there is a commitment there to that. Well, if there's any doubt to anybody watching it, I think it's an important fact to point out that a police officer testified at their trial that the two were set up, which is yes. not an insignificant fact. Yes, and in fact, that uh, police officer was then arrested uh, and imprisoned for violating uh, police rules. But the, the case was clearly a setup. It, it was clear in every aspect. One of the uh, police witnesses uh, said he had had notes of the arrest, but he had burnt his notes. Another one came in with writing on the side of his hand so he could remember what to say. A third one came in and said that they were instructed to set up our reporters. So th there's no question uh, that they were arrested because they were reporting on this massacre. In fact, their interrogation, uh, which was quite a brutal interrogation, their interrogation focused entirely on their coverage of that case. It had nothing to do uh, with so-called official secrets. And uh, as you know, the, the, the way they were set up is that they were invited uh, to, a, uh, to essentially to a restaurant to meet with some police officers who said they wanted to talk to them. Uh, they were handed a rolled up newspaper that apparently had some documents in it and told not to open it. They walked outside and they were immediately surrounded and arrested. So th this was just a blatant setup and the entire trial was based on that setup. So uh, I think everybody in the world knows that they're not guilty. The question is, uh, can we get them out? And that is uh, what we're working on. You know, I've, you know, we followed it here at, at Voice America and here and specifically I'm plugged in many times and I, I've been disheartened by the American media not putting a bigger spotlight on the, cry, on the issue of these two Reuters reporters in, in particular. Uh, is that, is, is the American media, does it have, if it, if it does put its spotlight on it, is it likely to have any influence in Myanmar? First of all, I'd say there has been very strong support, both from the media and from world leaders, from the Pope, from the uh, UN General Secretary, from uh, uh, representatives of countries all over the world. And there's been a lot of press coverage, and I think uh, the U.S. press has been quite generous in providing space you're, to me. You're and nicer to, about and, than and I am because others. you're not. You know what? You're nicer about than I am because every single day they could be tweeting about it wouldn't cost a dime and it take five seconds. Right. I think I think you're a gentleman because I don't right. agree with you on that. Uh, Okay, the, fair enough. Uh, 506 days is very challenging. So you know as well as I do that uh, news cycles move very quickly and, ma and maintaining attention is very difficult. So at key junctures, when there's an arrest, when, when there's a conviction, when there's a sentence, um, you get a lot of attention. I, and, and I agree with you, the challenge is in the in-between times, keeping up uh, that, that groundswell of support. Um, but I, I, again, I, I think it's important that there be solidarity around issues like this, and World Press Freedom Day uh, is another opportunity uh, to pay attention to it. Um, I think at the end of the day, the, the issue really is, does Aung San Suu Kyi and the uh, Myanmar government um, understand how important it is to reestablish ties with the world community, to reestablish its reputation for democratizing, for caring about human rights, for caring about press freedom. And uh, it, it's they who really have to act here. 
And I, I, th I think one of the challenges has been um, a lot of the Western community has just has not been that influential, although they, although they have tried. But I think the efforts are continuing and have to continue. Uh, clearly, you don't want to forget people who are sitting in insane prison in Yangon uh, for 506 days uh, just because they did good, honest, and fair reporting. There's been no challenge to the accuracy of their reporting. It's, it, and as you, as you say, it has won a Pulitzer Prize because it was so outstanding. And, and as an aside, before we leave, I'll take the last word on this, is that one of the impacts on this is that other reporters have not been able to get into the rocking state to investigate these atrocities or any other atrocities. So it's been very effective to discourage other news sources or reporters to even to risk their lives to go in there, understandably so. Yes, but it is possible to report there. You can report from Bangladesh. You can re you can use I've sources. Been there. And yes, <laughs> and and uh, there are people there. The families of the people who were massacred. We found all of them uh, in Cox's Bazaar, and we interviewed all of them. So we learned much more about the individuals. So yeah. often this stuff is impersonal, and we wanted to personalize it. Tell you these are real people. And they were. And with that, I, I got to go, but I okay. totally I agree with you. Thank you, thank you very much for joining us, uh, Stephen thank Adler, you, Greta. Reuters editor in chief. As you can imagine, press freedom is an issue we care deeply about here at The Voice of America. And VOA recently embarked on an effort to expand press freedom around the world. To tell us more about that initiative, we are joined by VOA Director Amanda Bennett. Thank you for joining us. Nice to see you, Amanda. Hey, thank you, Greta. Um, what is this initiative that we're doing here? So press freedom is actually at the core of what VOA is and what it does. We're not only the only source of credible information for a good part of the world, we also, for the part, good part of the world, represent the very idea that a free press can exist. So our initiative is, is designed to help kind of maximize that, that, that you know, mission that we have. And so we're going to be really focusing, uh, you mentioned with Steve Adler, on, on keeping the spotlight on, on various places. We're going to be focusing on telling more stories about press, press freedom around the world both the you know the challenges to press freedom but we're also going to try and educate people on things like for example how does a country go from a free press to a not free press what happens along the way how do people operate inside an area where it's not free so we'll be covering those stories a lot more than we have been in for you know we are so lucky it's not perfect here in the united states and i don't pretend that i mean i've locked horns with governments for the last 25 years but the, the value of having that constitutional right to free press most countries don't have that of course philippines has it but it's not it's not it's not enforced but you know most countries don't have that well and that's the difference between between us and a lot of the other countries which is the rule of law the rule of law exists and it's by and large respected and that makes a huge difference between us and the rest of the world for example even though voice of america is funded by the u.s government we have laws that keep us separate so we are truly yeah, an independent people voice to, the government has to leave us alone they have to leave us alone they can't they can't direct what we can cover and that's different between us and other state-owned broadcasts like like the russian state state broadcasters um, so what can VOA do to, to help you know, journalists around the world? I mean, you know, we got these two Reuters journals. I guess we can use the spotlight here uh, on our show. But I mean, there are so many journalists. Mexico, they're getting killed. Syria and Afghanistan, it's dangerous. I mean, what, what, do you tell, what do you tell the journalists here? Well, that's one of the things that we're hoping to focus on with this, with this show, which is bringing a spotlight to the journalists in trouble but also trying to bring out the kinds of things that restrict a free press. Because I don't think people around the world really know the extent to which, I mean, listening to, to Maria Ressler, I mean, I mean, the fact that governments use taxation, they use financial threats, they use threats to relatives. So making that clear to people around the world, I think is one of the best things we can do. Well, you know, it's just, it's shocking. To, I'm, I'm disappointed in the American media. Because, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm proud of Voice of America, what doesn't put in the spotlight here. And I tip my hat to my colleagues. But I, I think the American media could spend a little more time focusing on, on the issues around the world of so many journalists, because it does impact us back here in the United States. So that's one of the things that, you know, we think we can use our patch for, is that <laughs> this, is, this is who we are and what we're known for around the world. So we're going to try and amplify that a bit. Okay. Amanda, thank you very much for joining us. That's all the time we have here for today. Stay plugged in by liking us on Facebook at Voice America. You can also like my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Greta. And do follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thank you for being plugged in.